So, uh, welcome to everybody uh, for this uh, webinar on the occasion of the publication uh, of a full-fledged uh, European uh, border carbon adjustment uh, proposal uh, by uh, Europe Jacques Delors, uh, which is uh, the Brussels version of the Institut Jacques Delors in Paris and the Centre Jacques Delors in uh, Berlin what we call the Three Sisters. Uh, after my short introduction, uh, I will uh, give the floor uh, to Geneviève uh, Ponce, who is the uh, DG of uh, Europe Jacques Delors, uh, who will uh, present our proposal, uh, followed uh, by comments by Bernd Langer, who's uh, already with us. Uh, welcome, Bernd, and who is the chair of the uh, European Parliament uh, International Trade Committee. Uh, and then uh, followed by uh, comments by uh, Sabine Vajans, who is the uh, DG Trade uh, at the uh, European Commission. And I will, after that, moderate a debate uh, with uh, this uh, panel. Uh, of speakers, uh, Geneviève, uh, Bernd, Sabine. Willkommen, Sabine. Welcome Hans? to you. Uh, happy to that you have succeeded in being with us. So, at the end of this uh, conversation, I will moderate uh, this debate uh, between uh, Bernd, uh, Sabine, and Geneviève. So, please, for the many of you who attend, and I'm happy to see uh, such a large number of attendants uh, prepare your questions. Uh, this publication is uh, the number three in a series of uh, publications by Europe Jacques Delors, which we started last year following the European elections, when we got the political feeling that uh, the European trade policy needed some sort of uh, greening. Uh, we've already published two of these briefs. Uh, this is uh, the number three about this uh, border carbon adjustment proposal and uh, two more will follow in the coming uh, month. Uh, one about how to green EU trade agreements, including uh, multilateral agreements, and uh, finally how to use uh, EU's uh, market uh, powers within this endeavor, which we believe at Europe Jacques Delors is the way to go in greening uh, EU uh, trade policy. Two uh, words of introduction uh, of uh, my side before I uh, hand over to Geneviève Pons. Uh, many of you know I'm uh, an old monkey. Uh, and I've been working uh, on uh, border carbon adjustments uh, for many of my uh, previous uh, lives, uh, starting uh, 20 years ago when I was a European Trade Commissioner, uh, then roughly 10 years ago when I was a DG of the WTO. And I must confess, and this is the uh, thrust of these short remarks, I must confess that I have changed my mind on this uh, border carbon adjustment issue. Uh, so that's not the most interesting element. The most interesting element, I think, is why did I change my mind? And the reason why I changed my mind is uh, reasonably simple. Uh, in the meantime, the balance between the pros and the cons of uh, such a measure have, uh, in my view, changed. We know the cons, and those are the ones I was looking at 20 years ago and 10 years ago. The cons are a number of difficulties of a legal nature, including uh, WTO compatibility, of a technical nature, including uh, measurement of uh, the carbon uh, footprint of uh, imports and of a political nature, uh, which is the impact on uh, the European Union uh, trade partners, uh, which we have uh, to care about uh, a lot 
given that the uh, EU economy is and will remain highly dependent on exports. So we just can't go it alone without asking what's the impact on the uh, EU economy at large. Those are the cons. The pros are obviously uh, the main issue, which is address the carbon leakage problem as the price of CO2 within the European Union uh, increases, which is the main element that has changed. The balance in my view tilts from the side of cons to the side of pro. The moment the EU carbon prices evolve around a range of 40 to 50 euros a ton, we're not exactly yet there, but this will come very soon. If, if the European Union is uh, serious about increasing its own uh, carbon pricing via uh, the European uh, trading scheme, and as a consequence of that, in our view, the European Union has to get prepared uh, for a well-crafted border carbon adjustment. This is the very purpose of this proposal. Uh, this is the reason why at the end of the day, having a look at all the elements, I and my colleagues uh, who wrote this brief believe the EU now has to go in the direction. This implies a number of precautions, conditions, which is why uh, this uh, template for a BCA has been crafted uh, in detail in our proposal. And I will now ask uh, Geneviève Ponce to take over uh, to present uh, this proposal, which then uh, Bernd and uh, Sabine uh, will comment uh, before we debate. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, over to you, uh, Geneviève. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. And, uh, well, very, very happy to be here with you. We were supposed to, to have this presentation um, a few months before, on the 19th of March. And so we, we were struck, as everybody, by the COVID-19 crisis. And here we are, finally, to present this proposal, uh, who has not uh, substantially changed meanwhile. Uh, I will I will go through um, the previous attempts uh, of the BCA, both in the EU and the US, uh, and all of them have been failures so far. Uh, we must understand why, because for the reason that Pascal has just indicated, now we must succeed we must succeed towards our objective of climate neutrality by 2050, which means that we must put a substantive, a significant price on CO2, especially on the high carbon emitters. But if we do so, we must avoid carbon leakage because our aim, our supreme objective is to diminish CO2 emissions worldwide. So we must succeed now. And so for that reason, we must understand what have been the reasons of failure and must be able to overcome the legal, technical, and political challenges which are posed by uh, the BCAs. We will see that. So first of all, uh, Pierre, uh, please go to the previous ancestral. Uh, so we know, you, you know probably, uh, Bernd, Zarine, Pascal, and, and probably many of the persons who are listening to, to us today, that there were already tentative uh, at EU level. Maybe you don't know that uh, there have been also at US level. Um, in 2000, they were linked in the EU, at least they were linked to the ETS history. So the, um, our cap and trade system. 
uh, in 2007, there was an informal proposal from the European Commission at a time when uh, we were entering a new phase of the ETS uh, history and where uh, free allocations were supposed to be partly uh, replaced uh, by auctions. Um, in order to diminish uh, free allocations, the uh, European Commission envisaged at that time already to have a, a mechanism, an adjustment mechanism at the border. But the reactions, the preliminary reaction, were so um, negative that finally the EC did not propose a carbon adjustment mechanism, instead prolonged the free allocations. There were two tentatives from the French government. There was a, a French government non-paper in, uh, in 2009 targeting cement. And there, there was another one uh, in 2016 after the, the Paris Agreement, also targeting uh, cement. I will not enter into details. If you are interested, of course, I invite you to read our paper. In the, in the US, there were... I may one second. Yeah. Your, the sound of your mic is not good. Uh, and maybe you should to try uh, your earphones in order to help us getting a good sound. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, ah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit broken. At least okay, on my I'm... side, and I understand. Okay, I am very sorry for that, and That's unfortunately, excuse me. That's better. Okay. Uh, okay, I am very sorry for that, and unfortunately, I have not uh, any uh, uh, possibility to, to change it. I will go a bit quicker uh, and, and invite you to go into our uh, paper through the history of uh, the uh, US proposal, which were also failures. We have to understand why uh, there were so many difficulties and failure on both sides of the Atlantic. One of them, of course, is the necessity to be in conformity with uh, WTO rules. And these are the legal criteria for success that we have to respect. We have first to demonstrate the necessity and the proportionality of the measure. Uh, and for that, I will not enter into details. Once again, please read our paper we have to be in conformity with, uh, uh, with the GATT agreement and especially its Article 20. So the justification has to be linked to uh, health and uh, the protection of nature and environment. So the justification should not be the protection of the competitiveness of our industries, but rather the avoidance of carbon leakage, because this is the aim that we are collectively pursuing. It must be fair, it must be a fair measure, so no unjustifiable discrimination. This is one of the main principle of the WTO rules. We should avoid discrimination, at least not justifiable discrimination. And at the same time, we should uh, grant exceptions when they are justified. Uh, experience of previous cases show also that we should be we should put in place a system which is transparent and predictable and allows importers to demonstrate better results and pay less by proving a lower carbon content, content than the EU average. These are the legal criteria for success that should guide our choices. Now we go to the other uh, factors of success, we should overcome the technical and political constraints. Uh, the, the, the measure of carbon intensity of foreign products is not easy. It is less and less easy as uh, value chain fragmentation has accelerated during the last uh, decades. So it makes it difficult to measure the carbon content of a product at our border. However, we have benchmarks. 
we have ISO ones, ISO standards, and we have not only the standard that have been used for ETS calculation, but also some experience and data collection methodology gained around ETS. And this can be uh, um, used for uh, BCA uh, purposes. There are internal and external political and also legal constraints. We should, we, we are, we, should we choose between a tax or a custom duty for this border carbon adjustment mechanism? Our answer is no. First of all, it is not a tax. It should not be a tax because ETS, which uh, is the, uh, the domestic system, is not a tax. Also, we know that we need unanimity to adopt a tax uh, in the EU, and we know that it is out of our reach because we have tried. I can tell you the story, but we have tried. We know that we, it is out of reach. Custom duty poses also uh, many problems. So just keep in mind that we have to be as, as similar as possible to ETS. We should also, of course, avoid the risk of trade war escalation, which are particularly, uh, particularly severe in the present time. So these, these constraints lead us to propose uh, our solutions. The main, the, the main characteristic of the solution that we propose is a parallel system aligned with EU ETS. This is the best way to ensure fairness and to overcome the uh, question of uh, um, respect of WTO rules. EU ETS is something that has, has, which has finally worked. In my previous function as the head of WWF European Office, I was rather severe against ETS because ETS had not worked well until we changed it, we reformed it in uh, 2017. Uh, Bernd knows it well because it's, uh, it's uh, thanks to the European Parliament that we did it, even if many stakeholders pushed for that, but the reform has been successful. Uh, it has reached more than 25 euros before the COVID-19 crisis and now has come back to 22 euros. It should be able to reach much more if we want to, uh, to be carbon neutral by 2050. And that's why we need uh, this mechanism to avoid carbon leakage. The COVID-19 crisis has reminded us that we should avoid that the price goes to uh, becomes too weak. And that's why we propose also uh, to, to implement a CO2 floor price and the ETS. Now for the modalities, what we propose is a parallel system. It is not something which is part of the ETS because it would disturb the equilibrium of the ETS market. So what we propose indexation of the import quota to the domestic tone price the day before. It's uh, rather technical, but this is what, what the main characteristic of what we propose. We propose also to start with some pilot products. At the first, first uh, we, we presented already um, a, a preliminary review of our paper to OECD. At that time, we proposed only cement as a, as a pilot uh, uh, product. Uh, finally, we have added electricity. Electricity, we did it because it seems, I am cautious, but it seems that it is the first product for which we see some examples of existing carbon leakage. That's why we have added electricity. We, we propose as a benchmark, which is uh, rather obvious, the EU average CO2 intensity during production. These are the main characteristics. So we go further now, Pierre, please. Uh, the debate about uh, tax or, or, or a custom duty is a, is a difficult one for reasons that I have already given. It is not the tax. For, as a reason, we consider that it is not a custom duty, 
and especially because the custom duty has not the capacity to reflect the evolution, the um, daily evolution of ETS. However, in our paper, we propose to assimilate uh, the, the um, levy uh, to a custom duty for another reason, to be able to consider it as a, a EU uh, own resource, uh, because it's very important to be able to use it as a uh, um, EU own resource, and it is finally what the Commission uh, itself has proposed in its uh, 20 May uh, communication. These resources, we propose to assign them to two objectives financing of an independent agency responsible for assessing CO2 content of imported products and creation of an energy transition financing fund especially for the least developed countries. Now, Pierre, please. Okay, the fairness will be ensured by an independent agency. It will be open to, to non-European uh, experts and it will be notified to WTO. We propose to notify it to the Committee on Trade and Environment and to the TBT Committee and it will be in charge of de determining the outstanding balance for access to EU market, depending on the level of domestic CO2 pricing. Next point, Pierre, please. At the same time, if we want to be in conformity with WTO rule, we have to ensure the same pricing of domestic and imported similar products. That's why we need to simultaneously phase out free allowances. That's for, for me, that's a, a, a point which is rather uh, blunt and, and obvious, uh, even if probably uh, we will need to go into more details and we do go into more details in our paper. Uh, uh, please, next uh, one, uh, voila. And what we propose, and this is also the fruit of our discussion at the OECD Sustainable uh, Commission, uh, end of February, we propose to negotiate with our main partners and to use international organization for this negotiation. We propose to have a cooperative approach towards our uh, main uh, uh, trading partners. Uh, so, negotiation inside the OECD, WTO, and for developed country UNEP. We have uh, different scenarios. Uh, the, the one that we, of course, favor is to find an agreement with states that have equivalent CO2 pricing system, and also to come to a specific treatment for these developed country. In that case, there will be an exemption for the border carbon adjustment mechanism, as we will ensure the same CO2 price level. If we don't succeed, there will be the adjustment. So this is the summary, finally, of our proposal in one, two, three, four, five, six uh, points. And I leave you with that. And I thank you very much for your attention. I am looking forward for your uh, comments. First, Bent Langer. A chair of the INTA committee, and then Zabine Veyant, who is the director general of DigiTrade. So, first, Bernd, please, your turn. Thanks a lot uh, for the proposal and for the presentation. And uh, indeed, it's totally right, Pascal, that you changed your mind because we have to do something. If we are honest with our target for 2050, to be carbon neutral, then of course we can't go ahead with the situation as it is that we imported around about 20% of our emission and not paying for that. Uh, this is the case at the moment, more than 20% uh, of the domestic emissions were imported by products uh, from outside the EU. Um, and of course, we have also a situation that a lot of carbon intensive goods are imported to the European Union and we 
we are fine because we are not the, the, the producer of these emissions. So we have to really make a footprint of our consumption uh, of CO2 and not just have a division between domestic and foreign uh, production of uh, uh, CO2. Um, and um, by the way, the uh, carbon leakage and the carbon intensive products coming from outside the EU into the EU um, compensate round about 15% of our domestic sales. So we have a lot of measures in force now and 15% will be compensated because of carbon leakage and product coming outside uh, the EU into the EU. So we have to do something. And yes, I am in line with, with your reflection about possible restrictions we have to uh, live with. And first of all, and I will mention four, is the question of WTO conformity. We have the bound tariffs, we have the national treatment, um, we have uh, the uh, problem with quotas, we have the MFN uh, clause. So totally clear that we can't have a differentiation uh, line with countries and we have no possibility for uh, discrimination. So um, that's for sure. And even the WTO is quite weak at the moment. We should stick to, to the rules. And this, uh, uh, I um, appreciate very much in your proposal to make clear that we should go ahead with uh, WTO conformity. And of course, we have the possibilities got uh, to three and 20 to create some measures but in line with a clear message of uh, non-discrimination. Secondly, we have to reflect how trade partners will react, specifically the US and China, and your proposal of negotiations in the frame of WTO um, is one element uh, of uh, avoid uh, further uh, escalation. And secondly, also to start with selected sectors and not the whole broad possibility of uh, products is might might be also um, possibility to reduce the danger but at the moment uh, in the united states nobody knows under the current government what the reaction would be on China, uh, and of course, the two giants are the most important uh, partners in, in uh, our trading system and uh, in, 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 in possible danger of uh, such a uh, measurement. Um, in China, they are looking uh, in some sectors also on the ETS system, and there might be a possibility for negotiations. Um, so thirdly, um, the risk for poor countries. And there we have to reflect a little bit more. You mentioned just the developing fund coming out of the uh, income of the carbon border adjustment. Um, it's a bit complicated to argue that uh, developing countries have to pay also a price uh, uh, on the carbon adjust border adjustment mechanism if they, even they are not contributing totally uh, to uh, the CO2 mission uh, in, uh, in a broad uh, uh, part. Uh, and uh, secondly, um, it is really true that at the moment the benchmark marks we have are based on the European benchmarks, more or less. And this is not reflecting the situation of poor countries and also not specific companies in poor countries. And fourthly, of course, it has, has to be realistic and feasible. Uh, that's for sure. And then, of course, reflecting possible solutions. Uh, this fourth criteria uh, might be uh, really lead to a proposal on, based on the ETS system. Of course, there might be also other proposals. For example, the question of Stand, CO2 standards at the border. Standards which are uh, valid for domestic and imported products, as we did, for example, with REACH on the chemical uh, uh, side. 
Um, this could be also introduced by law by, inside the European Union. Uh, it would be also uh, non-discrimination uh, based. Um, it uh, might be also made clear that the EU would be front runner in um, energy uh, in, uh, intense, uh, effic efficient production. And um, it um, could also introduce uh, some elements of the life cycle uh, of products uh, on other elements than CO2. But of course, we have this problem of measurement of products coming from outside. And I see at the moment this is not really feasible. And therefore, based on my first criteria, this possibility would be not possible. Uh, secondly, a carbon tax uh, would be also a system which would be not uh, discriminatory. And um, there we have, of course, the situation, and you mentioned it, it, is, um, it needs unanimity by the member states of the European Union, and this will never happen. And uh, therefore, I think uh, it is also not a feasible solution, specifically regarding also the question that a tax might be also not in line, tax based on environmental reasons might be not in line with WTO uh, rules. Uh, this would be perhaps lead to a dispute. Um, even some member states have this huge tax like in, in Sweden and, and Ireland. So there could be a situation where we could build on. Um, third possibility to introduce duties on countries outside the Paris Agreement. It's a limited possibility. Might be also problematic regarding WTO and of course would focus at the moment only mainly on one country worldwide on the United States and this I think would really escalate the situation Nevertheless, we are discussing at the moment the enforcement regulations, Sabine, and perhaps uh, in this uh, there could be also a paragraph um, related to the fulfillment of the Paris Agreement. So, at the end of the day, my reflection are similar to yours. The feasible possibility is to build on the ETS uh, system and um, to avoid really big trouble, the negotiation phase you mentioned, I think is a crucial one, so that we try to bring the other partners mid uh, on board so that we will avoid further escalation and the um, selected sources and the phase in process is, I think, necessary to stabilize uh, the situation. I mentioned the benchmark, it's so far only the European side. We have really to look on the international based benchmark and specifically regarding poor quantity, also a specific company um, uh, benchmarks and perhaps company exemptions uh, to reflect their problem. Um, and uh, the solution, if a product based on a very energy efficient process is coming to the EU, what will they get for that? Will they get free allowance? Will they get money for that? This is a question I didn't, I didn't got an answer in your proposal. Um, the proposal was more built that the products coming outside from the EU are less efficient and uh, bring CO2 to the EU, but it could be also the other way around. And um, the question of the free allowance is a crucial one. You mentioned this. We have the legislation in force until 2030 at the moment. And looking to the situation of the steel sector, for example, it seems to be politically and perhaps also economically not possible to get away the free allowance from this uh, uh, sector. Um, so this phase out uh, process is a really high sensitive and, and, and complicated 
And I have at the moment, to be honest, no solution for that in my mind. We have to work on that. And last not least, uh, principal question. You um, said, and uh, Ursula von der Leyen said it as well uh, 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 last uh, uh, week, that these border adjustment mechanisms would be an element of the own resources of the European Union. Um, is this really a possibility to build on own resources on a process and products which you want to avoid? Uh, so um, at the end of the day, we are working to reduce the own resources. Thanks a lot, and I give the floor to Sabine. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, a lot has already been said, and I wanted to thank the Jacques Delors Institute uh, for a very timely contribution to a debate. Um, to start where Pascal Lamy left off, uh, the Commission at least has decided that uh, it is in favor of such a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, I don't think that we can say exactly the same for the other EU institutions. That is a debate we still have to have. And that will, uh, of course, depend on the quality of the work the Commission is doing in preparing a legislative proposal, which we aim for, for mid-2021. So uh, perhaps just a, a brief update of where we are. The Commission has been quite clear on the conditions under which it will propose this carbon border adjustment mechanism. And it is important to keep those in mind. The first is, this is in a context where the EU will up its climate ambition in a very important manner. Secondly, it is in a context where differences in global ambitions persist. That is another condition. Uh, thirdly, it will not be a horizontal measure, but it will be applied to sectors at particular risk of carbon leakage. Um, another condition is WTO compatibility. And in this context, one of the elements, but by no means the only one, is that we have to be clear uh, that uh, such a carbon border adjustment mechanism is an alternative to the current free allowances that aim at um, uh, addressing the risk of carbon leakage. So you cannot have a double whammy for, for sectors where they would be protected against uh, uh, dirtier imports, to put it colloquially, and at the same time would continue to benefit from free allowances. Um, so those are the, this is the context in which the Commission envisages the proposal for a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So the driver is the effectiveness of our climate policy. Uh, this may sound self-evident, but if you follow the political debate, if you follow arguments also of proponents of this measure, you see that this is very often um, confused with the general objective of level playing field, which of course feeds into the um, concerns of our trading partners that this is not actually a climate measure, but protectionism in disguise. And in this context, WTO compatibility is a necessary, but by no means a sufficient uh, condition uh, for ensuring that we are able to introduce this measure without risking major uh, retaliation measures. Now, what we are uh, looking at in this uh, context is several options, including the ones put forward uh, uh, in uh, the paper by the Jacques Delors uh, Institute, we are not yet ready to make a choice. So we are still at the stage where we are studying, consulting, technically uh, assessing the different options. And uh, in this context, uh, broad brush, what we are looking at is indeed a, a new carbon tax that applies equally to both domestic and imported products, which uh, is a, a requirement under the WTO of non-discrimination. Uh, this could uh, either replace unrealistic or complement possibly the ETS. 
Uh, second uh, option we are looking at is a new tax only on imports that would be set at the level of the effective carbon price inside uh, uh, the EU under the ETS. Uh, feasible, technically challenging. And the third is an extension of the ETS to imports by requiring importers to surrender uh, allowances. Now, all of these uh, uh, three options can be made WTO compatible, um, but they have their own characteristics and some sit more easily with the ETS than others. Um, the issue we have uh, also with the, um, with the preferred option, if I understand it correctly uh, uh, from your side, on an extension of the ETS to imports is that the ETS works on the basis of installations. If we look at imports, we have to work at the level of products. That is not, not exactly the same uh, approach. So technically, not that easy, but all of these options are possible. Um, so as I said, we are just uh, uh, still in the process of uh, studying this. We are also looking at the um, sectors. And again, uh, you have uh, been very courageous in uh, choosing just two sectors. We are obviously looking uh, at the whole uh, list of potential sectors at risk of carbon leakage. Uh, so what we are looking at is uh, cement, fertilizers, steel, non-ferrous metals, chemicals, pulp and paper, and glass. Um, and uh, uh, we are also looking in the energy sector at electricity imports. Now, all this is also because we need to cast the net wide in order to respond to the different interests of different parts of the EU. That doesn't mean that we will come with a proposal that targets all these sectors, but uh, the choice of sector has to be uh, better informed than uh, we can currently uh, ensure. Now, on uh, uh, the, the real issue that uh, is of concern to us is not so much the issue of WTO compatibility, but of international acceptability, which is much wider, and which I think you have picked up in your paper. And uh, from, uh, uh, from that point of view, um, the idea, there are several things we need to ensure. One is, and I Bernd Lange has identified that, very often the debate inside the EU is purely, look, is purely based on the assumption that uh, imported products uh, have a higher uh, carbon footprint than domestic ones. I think that is a very courageous assumption uh, and one which needs to be tested and where we need to give the importers the possibility to test that. And then indeed we have the question of how can we actually uh, that compensate rather than just uh, uh, create revenues from this measure. The other thing is that obviously the first thing we need to do, and I come back to, my, to the beginning of my remarks, the first thing we have to do is to try and see whether we can um, up the ambitions worldwide. And here, while our work inside the house has not been affected by the COVID crisis, um, Obviously, uh, the UN uh, 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 um, C work has been affected by this. So we are less advanced in uh, uh, global climate discussions because we don't have the necessary meetings, etc. That is a drawback because we need to give this a fair chance and engage internationally before we take a unilateral measure. Second avenue is the... Um, linking agreements between the ETS and third countries. And here I was uh, struck by the pessimism in, the, uh, in your paper, Genevieve, about the ability of uh, striking a linking agreement uh, between the EU and China. I think that is actually much more advanced than may be appearing uh, at this stage. So I think this is, uh, this is something we should keep in mind which, however, may be counterintuitive uh, to what certain people expect and, what, and the objectives that some people link with this climate measure. As I said, not everyone sees it, first of all, as an imperative of the effectiveness of our climate policy, but as a wider issue of leveling the playing field. Um, and um, this example shows that uh, the design of the measure and the impact uh, uh, 
will not be exactly will not be there to achieve these two objectives at the same time uh, necessarily. Now that brings me to the point that uh, Bernd raised. Um, of course, whenever you um, build the expectation of income on an environmental tax, you have the classical uh, conflict of objectives. And that's the same here. Uh, but you could make the same argument for the ETS, actually, because uh, the more it works, the, the less CO2 we produce, the lower the income. Uh, and obviously, if the conditions I mentioned uh, are not met uh, for the carbon border adjustment mechanism, well, then there will be no income or very limited income. Yeah. So that's something we, we need uh, uh, to keep in mind, but it is by no means uh, singular uh, to the CBAM. Uh, and it's something which uh, I think we are all well, well used to. Now, uh, the idea of uh, carbon clubs uh, seems to go further than our ETS linking agreements. And uh, I just wanted to say that this raises the same, I mean, with the ETS, we are already looking at um, harmonizing or approaching carbon prices between the participants in the ETS. Uh, what we do not have is a, uh, um, a, a joint carbon border adjustment mechanism common to uh, all participants in such linking agreements. But let's be very careful because the same uh, obligation of non-discrimination vis-a-vis uh, -vis third countries also applies in the context of a carbon club. So that requires some very careful uh, uh, construction. So. We are working full steam on this. Um, and uh, to conclude, one remark, which is a reply also to your, in part to your first question, um, I see one of the biggest political advantages of the CBAM, even at this stage, in the fact that it creates the confidence inside the EU that we can uh, up our level of ambition without facing the risk of this being undermined. Uh, through imports of uh, uh, more pollut polluting products. And this confidence building effect for me is the main benefit of already the discussion about the CBAM and the Commission commitment to make the proposal independently of the precise design, which will require a lot of further work, but where I think your paper is a very good contribution and identifies a lot of the issues we, will, we are looking at. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you. There we are. Okay, uh, Mike, on you, Ted. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the three of us for these uh, detailed uh, remarks. And I'm uh, very happy to see that overall, this template uh, which we have uh, tabled, uh, and that's the purpose of what Think Tank should do. Huh? Table proposal so that stakeholders, regulators, Commission, EU Parliament can then uh, work further on their options. Uh, and you've, I think, both of you, uh, Bernd and uh, Sabine, had uh, said uh, there is something very much in common uh, between what you said and what we say, which I think is, in a way, the backbone of the problematic of a border carbon adjustment is that it only has to do with the fact that the EU has to up its decarbonation ambitions. So it's not that a border carbon adjustment uh, is a good or a bad system, it's that as the EU starts being serious about high carbon pricing, we have to address this problem of carbon leakage. There are various options to do that. I think uh, Bernd explained uh, quite nicely why alternatives to a border carbon adjustment 
uh, would uh, really not work, which is also uh, the way uh, we see it. And I understand uh, Sabine uh, has added a few more conditions that make other options uh, even more difficult. Uh, I think uh, I listened very carefully uh, to what uh, Bern said about own resources. Uh, with this uh, interesting uh, philosophical question, very German-like, Bernd, why should we base a public resource on something which is bad? <laughs> which I think says a lot <laughs> about your logic. My only answer to that uh, uh, before uh, really giving you the floor on the basis of a few questions, Bernd, is this. This is what we decided to do. Uh, in uh, 1957. At the time, the main EU resource was customs duties, which the treaty said we should reduce because we were in favor of opening trade. So let me, in the German way, hide against the precedent argument <laughs> so that this question was already solved uh, in 1957. Uh, turning to Sabine, uh, I think a lot of what you said will be highly listened and very precisely listened to uh, by our audience, including uh, the rather long list <laughs> of sectors uh, uh, which uh, you are mentioning uh, and which you uh, announced so rapidly that I didn't even have the time of writing the whole list of what you add on top of our uh, cement and uh, electricity proposal. And I'm sure this will interest uh, very much our audience uh, because this is a, a new element. And I thank you a lot, Sabine, uh, for opening very much the game, opening the options the uh, Commission is uh, working on, I think uh, this is a good example of uh, transparency, not only uh, in uh, talk, but also in walk. So uh, let me uh, now to uh, move uh, to this precise question of uh, sectors. Uh, we, the reason why we, and uh, Geneviève, Pierre Le Turc, uh, uh, and myself, uh, tried to test this on cement and electricity is because we believe that the sensitivity of carbon leakage, the elasticity of carbon leakage to carbon pricing is, uh, starts at a very low level of carbon pricing. The question uh, on the sectors is if it's about aluminium, it's about steel, if it's about non-ferrous metals, it's about pulp, if it's about paper, it's about glass, at what level of EU domestic carbon pricing does the real problem of carbon leakage start? Uh, this is a, a first question, uh, mostly addressed uh, to uh, Sabine. Uh, then we have a question coming from the floor. Uh, which I would like the three of you uh, to answer uh, before moving to other questions, which is uh, a question which has to do with the news. We know the COVID crisis has hit uh, the uh, EU economy and the EU industry very hard. The uh, question coming from the audience is, is it time to add to this burden new regulatory uh, or uh, taxing uh, constraints, which would result in reducing the free allowances, which, as we know, is one of the ways so far this issue of carbon leakage uh, has been addressed. So let's start uh, with uh, these two questions. What about the sector scope of the measure? And second, what about the problem of uh, doing this now, just after a crisis uh, which has hit and will keep hitting our economy uh, very hard. Uh, maybe uh, Bernd first, uh, then 
uh, uh, Sabine and then Geneviève? Yes, thanks a lot. Um, uh, on the sectors, of course, um, it is uh, also a question of um, um, transparency. Yeah. So I think starting with the cement sector, it might be the easiest one because uh, the supply chain is quite limited and we have a lot of data. And uh, this is also valid for production outside the European Union. We have some international benchmarks. Uh, looking to the whole list uh, being proposed, uh, it is a really tricky issue to get the correct data for that. But nevertheless, uh, the Commission is competent and uh, I trust them more or less uh, to uh, 100%, not in any case. Uh, but, never, but it will be a hard work, but the, the argument to cover the whole European Union is also a valid argument, and uh, not just focusing on the cement producing uh, parts of the European Union. Um, but we have to be careful on the, on the database. Um, on the question of uh, additional uh, burden now in this uh, post-corona crisis, I think we have to reflect this. And this leads me to the clear uh, requirement that we need a, a really correct um, policy mix bet between the recovery plan and such border adjustment mechanism. Because look to the steel industry, it's totally clear that we can't go ahead in the situation as it stands now with coal and cokes in the uh, steel production. We need to change to hydrogen and that we need investment and really change the industry. And this has to be really linked to any carbon border adjustment mechanism so that we can really avoid additional threat to the industry uh, taking away the free allowance. But this is a really sensitive um, exercise. Thanks. Uh, Sabine? Uh, thank you very much. Now, the list of sectors is of, co of course not something I've made up on the hoof. Uh, it actually stems from a legal act uh, by the Commission where we identified in the context of the ETS the sectors most at risk of carbon leakage. And sometimes you have to go back to first principles and say if the objective of the CBAM is to address the risk of carbon leakage because carbon leakage risks undermining the effectiveness of the climate policy, then obviously we have to look at all these sectors. Does that mean that we will uh, cover all these sectors or start with all these sectors? No, but what I think will be very difficult to achieve and where we are not there yet is to strike the right balance between choosing the sectors most relevant for the climate effectiveness while sticking to sectors where we actually have the data. But I would warn against a situation where the choice of sectors is simply driven by the facility, uh, by the technical fa uh, uh, facility of finding the necessary data. Uh, that could undermine the acceptability of the measure as such, both internationally, but also inside the EU. Hence the need to go through the necessary studies to really have a well-focused choice of, of, uh, of sectors and uh, 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 maybe I repeat them again. Uh, it's, as I said, cement, as you say, fertilizers, steel, non-ferrous metals, chemicals, pulp and paper, and glass, and the energy uh, and the electricity imports. So, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still a limited list, but it is wider than what uh, uh, the Jacques Delors Institute came up with. On the issue of, is this the moment to add uh, new burdens uh, uh, for companies, regulatory or financial? I, I think you can turn the argument around and say, when, if not now? We have a situation where uh, we have a disruption of the economy uh, to a point uh, which we never anticipated and where we have to rebuild this economy. And this is the opportunity to rebuild it in a greener and more sustainable direction. And actually, we are in a situation where we can accompany the 
the modernization of our industry with the recovery instruments and the recovery strategy we have. So we have a chance to put together our climate policy, our industrial policy in a way that helps industry adjust to these new requirements. Um, and from that point of view, I rather see, I mean, if you have to look at the biggest crisis in living memory at a silver lining, I think that is one of them. This is an opportunity for us to do a big leap forward in terms of modernization and making our industry more sustainable and uh, uh, more climate friendly. Um, uh, Bernd Lange mentioned a few uh, sectors where this is already, I mean, a few examples where this is already the case. We are working, for instance, on a hydrogen uh, strategy inside the Commission, exactly to accompany uh, the uh, greening of the steel sector. Um, and uh, I think that is just one example. Uh, we are looking at other issues as well. I mean, the, I'm talking about the battery alliance, uh, etc. So, I mean, there are, there are lots of uh, instruments that we now have. And we have now the opportunity to pull them together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Geneviève? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I am on mute. Pascal, can you confirm I am on mute? Yes? No, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, fine. So on, on the first, I, I, will, I will take the two questions, the question of sectors and, and also the question of burden. So on the choice of sectors, to be very clear, what we propose is just a, a pilot, a, a choice for the, the pilot phase. And for reasons that Bert Lange has very well uh, indicated, we chose cement rather than steam. Also, we wanted to have two categories of sectors, sectors who have benefited until a very recent period of um, free allowances and sectors which have been obliged to buy their allowances. In the case of electricity, they have been obliged to buy their allowances. And it is very interesting to make this distinction also for the second point, the question of burden. Uh, in the case of electricity, the progress towards innovation and, and um, uh, the production of electricity becoming less and less CO2 intensive is a demonstration of the uh, efficiency of the ETS system when the allowances have to be bought and not got for free. What is the problem in that case? It is that the electricity producer, the, the European electricity producers, may be uh, in, um, may be uh, uh, faced with competitors who have not the same uh, regime. And it seems that we have examples of carbon leakages at the borders of the EU in the case of electricity. Uh, it could be between Spain and Morocco, it could be in the Baltic Sea, it could be in the Balkans. We have heard of possible examples uh, like this one. That's why we have chosen to have these two pilots in two different categories. Now for the, for the question of burden, First of all, with uh, a BCA, uh, we do not <laughs> increase the risk of, uh, of uh, the, the competitiveness risk for these sectors, for, first of all. And second, part of the ETS revenues are put in a, an innovation fund that will help uh, cement, steel sectors, and others to transform themselves. So they pay if the, the free all allowances diminish, they will pay more, but more will be put in this innovation fund that will come back in the form of, uh, the, the, for instance, the European program on hydrogen for, for steel or other, other very spectacular programs for cement. So this is also something that uh, should be kept in mind. There will be, there will be a reward for this uh, 
uh, auctioning of allowances. Okay, thanks very much for these answers. Uh, second round of uh, questions, which I pick uh, from uh, the audience questions. And we are getting inevitably uh, into uh, some sort of a technical discussion. Uh, uh, the first question comes from the French Treasury. Uh, and their question is, uh, all this uh, looks uh, fine on the import side, but what do you do uh, with uh, European exports in case you put together a border carbon adjustment, you address uh, imports, what do you do with exports? As we know, in the past, there were suggestions that in the same vein as uh, VAT uh, is uh, zeroed on the export side. A system that would increase the price of carbon coming from the import side should be uh, uh, offset on the export side. This is not if I understand well, and Geneviève uh, will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this is not the view we have taken. We have taken the view in the proposal to focus on imports, but this question of how about export uh, is raised uh, by uh, the audience. And then there is an even more technical question, uh, which is about uh, what price are you factoring in when you take uh, your levy, which varies according to the EU price. The solution which is on the table for the moment is uh, you take the price the day before. Is this the correct option? Being It being understood, and this is uh, the precise question, that uh, there is a futures market on the price of carbon where you can buy and sell allowances uh, uh, depending on the view you have of the weather price will be uh, some month or weeks ahead from now. Uh, does this uh, change the fact that uh, we, have, we need a sort of floating reference uh, domestic price in order to uh, uh, fix uh, the border carbon adjustment at the time of entry of the uh, good in question. So these two questions for uh, same order, Bernd, uh, Sabine, and uh, Geneviève, why uh, I am uh, collecting more questions from the uh, Q&R uh, chat. Bernd? Uh, yeah, thank you, Jean-Pierre. Um, I think the experts, uh, this is a uh, different system. Uh, we have always also discussed uh, just uh, measure the uh, CO2 footprint on imports and exports and give them uh, incentives or uh, some uh, uh, additional costs. Uh, but now we are really focusing on the uh, import side and this leads of course to allow partner countries to do uh, the same. And on the export side, of course, we will still discuss the standards uh, setting system specifically uh, regarding the circular, um, uh, circular economy, um, uh, the proposal of the Commission is on the way. Uh, yeah, and the, the, the price, um, of course, uh, it has to be easy. And, and I guess uh, the situation, the, the actual price or the uh, price of the last day is the most uh, feasible possibilities. But of course, this has some um, elements which are not totally fair, but um, I think uh, at the moment, I see no other possibilities to, to uh, have it. And we have the same situation um, in, 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 in um, selling and, and buying uh, certificates at the moment. Um, by the way, um, one question in my introduction was not uh, answered. Uh, what are you doing with products coming from outside the EU? where the efficiency is much better. For example, Japan is producing steel, uh, more or less a CO2 neutral. Will the company get some allowance? Will Japan get allowance? Or will they be paid? Or what is your proposal? Uh, 
Okay. Sabina? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, on the issue of uh, exports, my reply is a non-technical one, rather a political one. Um, we are in a context where we want to send a signal for strong global climate ambition because it's only through that that we can uh, uh, address the climate challenge. Um, what is the signal we would send if we were to sort of encourage uh, production to be exported to destinations that have lower levels? So from that point of view, I think this is a very tricky question. I do understand the competitiveness element of it, but there's no simple answer to this. And uh, uh, that is why we have not looked at uh, uh, compensations in this respect. Uh, as to the price uh, to factor in, uh, I'm quite happy to leave that to Genevieve because this is linked to the system you propose. Um, there would be a way around that, uh, for instance, in a system which is based on uh, the surrender of uh, allowances, uh, because then you deal with the quantity and you leave the price to be decided as it is now under the ETS. You have a market for that. Uh, so you don't have to go into micromanaging and fixing a price the day before the import, etc. So I think this would be uh, uh, an advantage uh, to a system that is uh, uh, based on the surrender of, uh, of allowances, uh, which then can be purchased uh, whenever, wherever. Um, so, but uh, I'm looking forward to Genevieve's answer because that will inform the study of uh, this option, which, as I said, is also one which uh, is part of the work we are currently doing in the Commission. <clears throat> yes, uh, okay, so uh, I must say that on exports, I, I, am, I am very much in line with what Sabine has just said. We want to give a signal on the international scene that we are serious at uh, fighting CO2 emissions. And when we envisage a, a carbon uh, adjustment, we do it to avoid carbon leakages and to avoid that globally the level of CO2 emissions uh, continues to, to decrease. And I have not used it this time, but uh, many other times in my presentation, I used uh, pictures showing how CO2 is traveling around the world and how much CO2 is coming back to Europe. And actually, if we consider our footprint, as Bernd said say, uh, in his uh, speech, um, our progress since 1990 are very small, very small. So, you know, we, we really have to send this signal and to be understood. If we want to, uh, to, to, to include exports, we will enter into many technicalities and we will give the wrong signal. So that's why we have decided not to enter into uh, this debate. And we have a strong reserve about it. Uh, now, about the price, we propose something which looks for the time being to be uh, the, the easiest and the fairest uh, way to deal with it, but we are not at all uh, close to any other uh, solution that would be uh, even fairer and easier to apply. So that's just one, one possibility that looks for the time being to be the right one. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, another round of questions uh, on which I will uh, uh, pick uh, one of them, uh, which I think is a rather important one, uh, because none of you so far has uh, one sector, uh, which is, I understand, seen CO2 emitting, uh, which is agriculture. So the question coming from the floor is, uh, what do you do uh, with uh, agriculture, uh, which uh, as far as we know is not 
subject uh, to uh, uh, any system of uh, CO2 emission taxation, hence competing with others that uh, may or may not uh, be uh, taxed. So question, what agriculture? Should it be a sector to be considered? Uh, to which I add, uh, by the way, one question which uh, Bernd uh, mentioned en passant uh, in his uh, comments, and which I think is an interesting one, uh, although, although more related to the export side to the import side, uh, which is uh, if the real issue is to avoid carbon leakages and fitting with a proper CO2 price, uh, what if EU exports are of higher carbon content than EU import? At the end of the day, the fundamental purpose uh, is to decarbonize our economy. Should not we, in this case, favor imports into the EU domestic markets, the carbon footprint of which is better than our domestic production. So it's one thing to tax, levy, put a price on imports if the carbon footprint is priced lower than our domestic market. But what about the other way around? So agriculture, and uh, this other way around question. Uh, Bernd, uh, Zabine, and uh, Geneviève. Yeah, and, uh, you're quite right with the question on agriculture, no doubt about. Um, uh, but at the moment, uh, it is not uh, uh, um, in, in the focus of uh, uh, um, the domestic and, and, and also international measures. And, um, uh, of course, uh, we have to, to reflect on that. Um, but uh, once again, uh, if you would really introduce uh, something on the uh, CBM, then of course uh, the question of uh, um, benchmarks, the production process of meat in Argentina compared to Europe is really a complicated way. I think this is firstly a dom domestic obligation to reduce the CO2 footprint of our production inside the European Union. And this will, of course, minimize the CO2 footprint for the export. And we are exporting a lot of agricultural products to the world. And this leads to the second uh, question, quite interesting. Uh, um, and this is also a little bit linked to the question of, of Japanese uh, steel. Uh, so we are should not use only the European glasses that we are the front runner of the world, but perhaps the footprint of some products is outside the EU uh, better than inside the EU, and this has to be reflected. Um, uh, I'm not now in, in, in favor of uh, stopping uh, European production, no doubt about, but we have to find, uh, um, let's say, equivalent regulations so that uh, at the end of the day, this effect will not undermine our um, domestic uh, uh, policies. But uh, you're quite right. Uh, this, this is a possibility we have to deal with. And we can go ahead to uh, establish protective measures to that. Sabina? Ah, we've suddenly lost Sabine. Uh, so, uh, am I correct that we have lost uh, Sabine? That's what I see on my screen. Ah, she's coming back. Oh, she's back. She's back. She's back. Good. Good to see you back. Sorry, I now just have to unmute myself. Now on. I, on the agriculture question, I think, again, let's go back to basics. What we are discussing here 
is uh, a mechanism to compensate for uh, obligations we have put on EU industry with the ETS. And where therefore, uh, given the discrepancy around the world, there is a risk of carbon leakage. In agriculture, we are not in the same situation. I think that is also what Bernd Lange referred to. We first of all have an obligation to green the cup and the reduction of emissions is essentially now uh, uh, supposed to happen through the subsidization uh, through the common agricultural policy. Um, I think that we will have to do an analysis, but when I look at what we are doing in our sustainability impact assessments, uh, where we also assess the impact of our trade agreements in terms of uh, the CO2 uh, balance, what we see very often is that third countries have more climate friendly uh, production conditions uh, than uh, we have. So I think that the first obligation is to reduce uh, emissions inside the EU from, uh, uh, through, through the CAP uh, reform, and that is foreseen. And then we will look at, at this internationally, but uh, it is one of the sectors where I would really warn against thinking that we are the ones uh, being the pacemakers here uh, uh, internationally. The second point is we have uh, on this issue of uh, uh, what carbon price, how to deal, wouldn't we have to favor imports in some areas where they have uh, less of a carbon footprint? Again, let's remember that we have introduced the ETS as a market-oriented uh, instrument where it is the carbon price that drives uh, where uh, 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 savings of CO2 happen. And in that case, if everyone pays the fair price for their CO2 emissions, if imports are uh, uh, cleaner in that respect, they will have an advantage. That is what we need to do. That's why the, the whole uh, baseline of this is the carbon price. And here, allow me one comment on the paper on which I haven't commented yet and which ha we have not really discussed in detail. I'm very skeptical because of what I just said about this idea of introducing a floor price in the ETS. I do not think that a once in a lifetime crisis of unseen proportions should drive structural changes in the ETS. We have opted with the ETS uh, for a system where we uh, try to steer and manage quantities and the price follows. If we now mix that, first of all, we will have an endless debate of where to set the floor, but more importantly, the carbon price loses its reliability as a signal for investments. If you put, I mean, it, it will be in, immensely complicated to agree, on, to agree on the floor price, and obviously it would have to be adjusted. And that will be a political process and not a market-driven process. And we risk distorting the investment signal. Uh, if we put the price too high, then we will drive investments into directions which are not sustainable. So I would really, I'm, I'm really very skeptical about that. Um, so I think that's what I wanted to say in reply to the two questions. Thank you. Sabine, uh, I'll now give floor to Geneviève. And as we are reaching uh, not exactly the end, but quasi the end. Uh, I will have one more question for the three of you to address, which is raised uh, by several in our audience. Uh, and I'm giving you the question before Geneviève answers uh, the uh, round which you are answering uh, so that uh, it's clear that it's the last uh, question. Uh, which is about uh, developing countries and mainly least developed countries. The question which is raised by uh, several in the audience is should least developed countries be waived from a border carbon adjustment the same way as it was the case for uh, everything but arms? And what sort of problems does this raise about the check of the origin of products, which is an issue uh, which was uh, raised at the time where everything but on. But first, Geneviève, 
uh, answer to the last round of questions, and then I will ask Bernd, Sabine, and Geneviève to address uh, this LDC question, and then we will close in order to remain in the slot of time uh, we had uh, for us. Geneviève? Thank you. Uh, so maybe I will start with the minimum price. Um, I, I was, you know, I, I was, um, I was part of the birth of ETS as I was working in the commission at that time. And I saw all the weaknesses of uh, ETS from its inception. And especially the level of production and the level of CO2 emission that had been declared by industries was so high that it was not a constraint for them to diminish. And from the start, there was a weakness in the system. There was so much, it was so easy to, to um, respect the constraints that the price was very low. And what happened with a very low price, which was the case until 2017-2018, the price was between 5 and 8 euros per tonne. The result was that there was very few progresses made by certain industries. I do not want to, 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 to point my fingers to, to them, but uh, except from, I spoke about electricity, where there were really very good progress made. In other industries, there were no progress made because ETS was not, was not efficient. ETS with a very low price was not efficient. That's why, even if I have the highest respect for market mechanism, market mechanism sometimes have a very uh, poor result for the reason I, 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 I gave. Uh, um, and, they, and it has to be corrected. That's why I think that a minimum price is a good idea. Now, for agriculture, uh, Sabine, you are right. We are for the time being not um, charging agriculture for the CO2 they emit. And there are systems which, which are being proposed, very inventive, very clever, that allow to put a price on a type of agriculture and the way the soils are respected or not respected and the level of CO2. And if this uh, very uh, inventive system uh, see the, the, the light of the day in Europe, then we will have a, a, a system uh, similar to ETS for agriculture, and the question of uh, CBAM uh, will be uh, uh, pertinent for agriculture. I think I will stop here because uh, the time is uh, running fast. So up to you, Bernd, now. Bernd, Zabine, and uh, Geneviève. <laughs> on impact on uh, least developed countries of such a border carbon adjustment. That's the final question. We have many, many, many questions that are coming now uh, in the series. Uh, we will, of course, transmit them to uh, the three uh, panelists, but time to close while focusing on this uh, developing country issue, which usually EU is more sensitive to than other trading powers. And uh, Pascal, I think this is really the most uh, difficult aspect of the design of a carbon border mechanism. Because it's totally clear, these developing countries, developing countries are not uh, contributing to the CO2 problem as much as the European Union uh, did. And we have to reflect um, that. Um, and uh, it could be um, uh, in, in some way, uh, way uh, seen as a protective measures. I remember very well the palm oil uh, discussion with uh, some developing countries uh, where environmental reasons uh, destroyed uh, some developing possibilities in, in, in uh, third countries. So we should really focus on, of course, our bilateral possibilities to um, and empower the partner countries to fulfill our requirements, but we should also open-minded to get some um, ex, uh, uh, some some specific solution 
not only for countries, but also for companies in specific countries to get some uh, uh, exemptions for uh, uh, companies to give them uh, the necessary air to uh, breathe. Good. Nabin? Um, yes, I think here again we have to go back to first principles. This is uh, a measure of climate uh, policy effectiveness. And here we have to recognize, as Bernd Lange said, that uh, least developed countries, but also the vast majority of developing countries, are not major contributors uh, to the climate issue. Uh, we will have to look at, again, the issue of non discrimination in the WTO, but that means that there can be no arbitrary uh, distinction being made, but we need to look at uh, the prevalence of local conditions, climate policies, etc. So we cannot do a blanket uh, uh, exemption for all developing countries, but we need in line with the principle of uh, common but differentiated uh, responsibility under the UNFCCC, uh, we need to factor in the specific local conditions and that should be the guiding principle when we, when we look at that. Um, Last word on uh, uh, Genevieve. I agree with you on the design flaws of the first ETS, but I think a lot has been corrected uh, following with the uh, market stability reserve. And I think we will look at this issue of uh, sudden drops, uh, etc., in the review of the market stability uh, uh, mechanism, which will come up in 2021. So this is certainly something we'll continue working on. Um, and otherwise, I think indeed this has been very interesting, but I also see that we have uh, only scratched the surface. But, uh, so it's very good that we have a full year ahead of us before we have to come with a legislative proposal and we can continue discussing all these issues and fine tuning our responses. Thank you very much. Good. Geneviève? Um, I will be very brief uh, as what we propose in our paper is guided by the principle that Sabine has just uh, recalled to everybody and so for, for the developing countries uh, it will be the fruit of, a, of a, an examination uh, respecting the principle of WTO but with a very favorable uh, I, I would say. Market stability reserve uh, could be could act as a, a minimum price if it worked uh, even better than it does now, uh, but it is not yet the case. <laughs> okay, very thanks very much uh, to uh, Bernd Lange, Xavier Neveille, and uh, Geneviève Pons. Thanks for these many many questions from the audience. I will uh, conclude the way Sabine just did it. Uh, <laughs> We have a proposal that uh, scratches the surface. The, the uh, conversation this morning uh, did a bit more scratching, uh, which means that you still have, uh, as you say, a, a year ahead in order to get it right. Uh, but that's exactly the purpose of things to try and push you accelerating the options to get it right uh, and i will uh, conclude by sharing uh, one of the answers i gave in private to uh, a question which was when do you think this bca will be in place and i'm saying this including for bernd langer my tentative answers was just before the end of the mandate of this European Parliament just before the next European elections. That's my political answer to this <laughs> extremely complex question. Thanks to you all. Thanks for uh, your object de l'or for having organized this. Thanks to Pierre Leteuch, who we do not see on the screen, uh, but who is uh, working very closely with uh, Geneviève. Uh, on the technicalities of this uh, webinar. Uh, thanks for having joined us. Et uh, à Sabine uh, et à Bernd, uh, bon travail sur ce sujet pour les quelques temps qui viennent. Merci à tous et à toutes. Au revoir. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Tchuss. Tchuss.